Join us today for a fabulous episode with the dynamic duo of Jackie and Gabrielle Rail from Camp Waro in Quebec, Canada. We dive deep below the surface of what appears to be a typical mother-daughter relationship to discover there's nothing typical about this team. From growing up at camp to coming up both professionally and personally, this duo shares lessons learned and some funny stories along the way. Welcome to Beyond Camp, where we explore the intersection of camp in our lives. For too long, camp professionals have referred to camp as being in a bubble, and we're here to burst that bubble with you today. We know that camp intersects with every aspect of our lives. We're excited to delve into those. We are your hosts, Rachel Kent. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm Cassie Bloy. My pronouns are also she, her. We're here to go beyond camp with you today. As a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today, and be sure to check out the show notes at gocamp.pro slash beyondcamp. Now, let's get started. Today, we're here with the fabulous Jackie and Gabs from Camp Waro. I want to introduce both of them quickly before we dive in deeper and really get to know them. Jackie and her family became owners at Waro in 2002, and they've worked diligently to develop programs and activities while maintaining the camp's traditions. Jackie's lifelong camping experience has enabled her to contribute to the international camping world, and she's been on a variety of boards, including the International Camping Fellowship. Amongst her many awards, in 2019, she was awarded the Ron Johnstone Lifetime Achievement Award, and she was the first woman in Quebec to receive the award. Gabs is passionate about girl empowerment, team building, and leadership, and takes the lead in camper development. She's an internationally recognized speaker amongst camp professionals on leadership and training, and is one of the founders of the Women at Camp Summit that you hear Cassie and I speak about all the time, and the Thanks to Camp movement. You'll also recognize Gabs' voice as one of the co-hosts of both Camp Code and Camp Hacker. Also no stranger to awards, in 2017, she received the Jack Pierce Award of Honor by the Canadian Camping Association. Welcome to both of you. We're so thrilled to have you here. Yay! We are too. Awesome. Uh, Before we dive in, we like to ask our guests to share a few words about how they identify. And this can be in the camp world, outside of camp, just five or six words that you feel like um, really sort of address who you are. And we also welcome you to share your pronouns if you're comfortable. Uh, Jackie, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, My pronouns are she and her. And I guess a few words about myself, a uh, camp director, owner, mother, uh, friend. I think that's it. <laughs> uh, all around so, awesome person. Uh, <laughs> fabulous. Thanks so much, Jackie. What about you, Gabs? Uh, my pronouns are elle, she, her. And I would say, uh, yes, camp pro, designer, and above all, collaborator with other wonderful people. Fabulous. Well, we're grateful to have you both here. I'm going to hand it over to Cassie to get us started. So we all know that camp brings a lot of connection to people. How did camp allow you to connect as mother and daughter? Mm -hmm. Well, well, you have a perspective of me growing up in camp. Yes. Yeah. So, um, we have three children. Gabrielle's our oldest and we have two sons. So Gabrielle was the only sibling to actually attend Camp Oro as we were all girls. Um, she started camping when she was 10. Her father wouldn't let her go to camp until there was decent showers built. Yeah. So we know how old the showers are depending on how long <laughs> I've been at camp. <laughs> I love that. That's um, great. Gabrielle uh, didn't call me mom. At camp, she called me Jackie the way everybody else did, and she tried as much as possible to not have a, a, as few campers as possible to know outrightly that we were mother daughter. Uh, one year in August, we were standing in line at the dining room. It was July. She, it was July. Yeah. She was asking, calling my name and calling my name, and I didn't reply. And she went, Mom. And then she saw everybody look at us and she switched to August. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I ruined that lot. <laughs> I needed a new fresh of friends. <laughs> I think that I think that I was it was very clear from the get-go that any kind of um, critique or anything like that needed to go through someone else other than myself. So the past director owner always took care of Gabrielle if there was something that needed to be discussed. Uh, praise always went through uh, the same as anybody else. Um, I think when she was a counselor in training and when she was a young staff member, we just made sure she had strong 
leadership support and that if there was things that needed to be discussed with me, that was always in private. And I always made sure that other people were there to take care of her as that it would be easier for other staff and other campers and stuff to mm -hmm. respect her, I think. Um, we did have our sons working for us and um, that was in some ways good and some ways not so good as we're all girls. And um, so they had to sort of find their way. And our youngest son is not really the camp type uh, of person and our oldest son is. Mm -hmm. So they had, you know, challenges and great celebrations at camp. They're all very well, well known in camp. Um, I was very able to utilize <clears throat> different people in my camp to help me with, with my children. I remember when my oldest son was 12 and he stopped saying he loved me in public. And so I told one of my um, leadership team and an hour later the phone rang and it was like, Chad, the phone for you. And the next day when we were at school and I went to pick him up, he said, I love you, mom, in front of everybody. <laughs> so there's lots of advantages of having children at camp and being a professional at camp. I think it's just being very aware of the fact that you need to step back yeah, and not defend. You have to listen the way you would with other, other staff members and campers and make sure you have, surround you with people who will be honest and also compassionate with your child. Gabrielle had some staff who would really sort of suck up to her yeah. and some staff who were outright, outrightly mean with yep. her. And so we had to try to find a balance and I think we did a good job at it. Yeah, and you, you also sent us away to other camps oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so that we could have other experiences outside of personally for me being here, growing up here, having my parents uh, be in charge. Um, that was something that, you know, they wanted me to have my own camp experience and, and you know, what that would, would look like. But I definitely had the, the gamut of staff members where you would have those that did suck up and then others that, um, I, I particularly remember one instance where a staff member was very, 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 very passive aggressive towards me during a meal time. I, and she criticized everything, how I was holding my fork, how it, I just didn't understand it. And only a couple of years later, I had found out that she was frustrated with her job and she was particularly frustrated with Jackie. And so there is that, that other end. But then, of course, there were some wonderful staff members that took us under their wing. So as I think Jackie did really, really distance herself from me and allowed me to have my own camp experience as much as she could. That sounds like there's a lot of boundary setting and talking about where that relationship is defined in different settings. Was, was being that mother, daughter, camper, camp director, or staff member, employer, was that positive in your relationship? Was that a good thing for you or did it alter how you connect now? Uh, I think, I think that as I am a big person of asking other people how, how it went, um, my boss had a daughter and a son at camp. And so I watched her and how she interacted. And I, I learned things very early on that I needed to take time in the day to make sure my family knew I was still around. Yeah. So every single night, no matter what was going on, I put my kids to bed. So I read them stories. I did their bath time. Um, I just made sure that I was there for that one hour a day. Um, I, I think that, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but Gabrielle and I are very different personalities, mm -hmm. almost complete opposites. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that has made our working relationship actually quite positive and quite efficient. And I think that that we learned very early on. And especially it's just, I think it's just respecting your children as people <laughs> and that, that they're, they're in a place that we need to understand that it's difficult to be um, surrounded by people all the time. And, and that I think is what my children found the most difficult yeah. was that from um, sort of <clears throat> May to the end of September, things weren't their home anymore. Like staff would just walk into our house or my boss would just walk into our house and 
you know, th those things I found difficult. So we talked a lot about that. And we talked a lot about the advantages we had by growing up here yeah. and being in the country and, you know, all mm -hmm. those kinds of if that helped yeah and, and i think i think that it evolved our boundaries evolved as as i got older and started becoming more full-time and that's something that we had to redefine i think you know um in quebec you you go off to college at 17 and where where camp is you have to move away from home so i moved away at the age of 17 years old and um and we had like great you know phone conversations i came back home every weekend um, but then when I started working full time, you know, I would get phone calls at nine o'clock at night. And sometimes I didn't know if it was Jackie, my mom that was calling or Jackie, my employer that was calling. And, and that created some anxiety. I didn't realize it did, but it was, it was tough because mm -hmm. at, at one point you want your mother, you know, and you don't want to guess, you know, who, what's at the other end of the line. And that was something that I was nervous to talk to her about. But I think because of the boundaries that she had created while while I was at camp as a camper and then a young staff member, it was actually quite easy when when we we started creating like you know at five o'clock after that there's no more shop shop talk. So if she's calling at nine o'clock at night, I know that she's calling to check in on me and see how how she's doing. And I think also, as Jackie mentioned, we are very two very different people. And one of the things that she can do is, her brain's always in a camp mode. She's always thinking about that. And uh, I'm a very in the now type of person. So once I, <laughs> once I'm done work for the moment, I'm like, woo, a butterfly, you know, and that's where my attention's going to. So getting sucked back into work was tough for me, but for her, it's so fluid. Um, that, that, that was something that we had to sort of negotiate and figure out and, and adjust. But, you know, those are, uh can feel like tough conversations but are really really important conversations and the the piece about jackie that's helpful is that she uh, i've always had an experience of her listening and this is not me on a podcast trying to be like oh here's a squeaky beautiful sparkly version of our relationship we're not a dramatic family um <laughs> camp camp family but that's because we've worked hard at it and not saying that other organizations don't but we also because of our personalities it has allowed us to, um, to, to really, where our strengths are, really fit very, very well together. Um, and so it allows us to, to have these type of conversations and uh, just create a balance of a family slash work life experience. And, and I mean, right now is a good example. I'm living up at camp because of the pandemic. I'm not living in the city. And I work in my cabin throughout the day and then we have dinner together. And, it's nice. Like we don't mm -hmm. talk about camp. We have a great time. Like it's, it's very lovely, but that's the years of us practicing this. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love the honesty there of like, this mm -hmm. took practice. It didn't just like magically happen uh, because I think that that's important for people to hear with any relationship dynamic um, that these yeah. things take practice and you have to curate what it is that you want. Yeah. Um, Jackie, you mentioned something about how you, it's important for you to see gaps as a person sort of like beyond camp. Um, and part of who we are at camp is our various identities and how they intersect with camp. And that's something that we're passionate about talking about here on this podcast. Um, and so Gabs and Cassie and I were lucky to have a fabulous conversation pri prior to this. And um, Gab shared her willingness to discuss her coming out story. Um, and I, I share that we had this conversation prior because um, it's important that we all know that we should never out somebody um, without their right. permission. So <laughs> we had this great conversation. We clarified boundaries around this. Um, and lots of people have coming out stories, you know, at camp when there are campers or staff, but I think sometimes we don't talk about that in a professional light, what that is like yeah. coming out as a camp professional. Um, and Gabs, I'm wondering from your perspective, if you'd be willing to share sort of your view of the story and then Jackie afterwards, if we can hear your perspective as both a director and camp professional, but also a mother to your daughter. Yeah, I think, thanks thanks for asking. And yes, we did have a conversation. And yes, I did give permission. Um, so for, for me, I came out later in life in my mid thirties. I was in a relationship with a man for 12 years before that wonderful person who's still my best friend and still uh, is part of our family. And, you know, growing up, growing up at a summer camp, uh, not from my parents at all, you know, in our family, <laughs> Um, you know, one of my cousins is, is out and in, in our family, he's not welcomed at everybody's home. 
And he is definitely was always welcomed in our house. So there was some clear messages in my household that, you know, whoever you are, we love you. And that's just the way it is. But I got messages from the camp industry itself. And I remember a, a gentleman that worked for an organization that came over to my parents' place, just, I think I was about 14 or 13. And he was just broken. He looked broken to me and he was fired for being gay. And that sent a very, very strong message to me. There was other things that, that had occurred in outside of the, outside of my life, not my family home, but just even at camp, I just didn't see anybody part of particularly a same gendered camp, um, a private organization where people were, were out uh, and in charge. That was just something I never saw. And I thought, well, this is not for me. I, you know, I, I didn't realize how much I loved working at camp until I realized how long I stayed closeted because I was afraid of losing what I, I love the most, which is working with children. And growing up, I remember also on, on the news simultaneously hearing, um, you know, gay and pedophile uh, mm -hmm. pair together. And uh, the other hat that I wear is a graphic designer. This is not at all an issue within the graphic design or art industry or music industry, but when you're working with children, it's still sensitive. And I did not feel like I was going to be welcomed or that I would be allowed to continue my job uh, and, and I was, and this was, you know, I'm tied to my family and my job. And so this caused a lot of anxiety. And so when I realized fully to myself, my authentic self is, is a queer woman, um, you know, I, I came home to tell my parents, I, I think, I don't remember exactly how much alcohol I drank, but I believe, <laughs> I believe it was scotch and I believe there was a full bottle. And then there was maybe a one fourth of the bottle, quarter of the bottle left when I was able to like utter the words that I was gay. I was so nervous that camp was going to be taken away. And I think it wasn't going to be my parents taking it away, but it was just going to be like, we, this just can't happen. You can't be in charge. Cause I hadn't seen the proof of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just was welcomed with such, you know, like, we love you. We're proud of you. And then I asked like, can I still work at camp? <laughs> And I think my parents, my mom, Jackie looked at me like almost like with a confused face, like, why would you not be allowed to work at camp? And I was like, because of the gays in camp, are they allowed to be there in charge? I don't know. Like, you know, especially in, in, in the same gender camps, it's just something I hadn't seen, which is why it's important for me to talk about it more. Um, you know, both my parents just wanted me to be okay and happy my angoise had to do with so much outside of the camp industry, which I think we still need to keep talking about. And especially with people that work with children, there's still like a little bit of an anxiety and taboo that goes around that. Um, and even with camps across Canada, uh, th that were certain, up until recently, you know, we're not welcomed at the LGBTQ plus uh, community. So it, it's, it's a, and, and being part of so many other camp groups, I was just nervous that all of my, all of that was going to be taken away. Um, mm -hmm. That was my experience of coming. What did you, what did you experience? Did you notice me keep going into the kitchen, like pouring glasses of, of scotch? I don't know if I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I remember our, our living room is very small and we have sort of this big table that my husband has made like a coffee table. And she sat on the other side and she said, no, like matter a barrier. What, no matter what I say, you can't come, a, come across the table. Yeah, I didn't want affection. I needed space. <laughs> and so she, she gave her, her very planned speech, I think. And she looked, and before I could say anything, uh, my husband said, I love you. Yeah. And she was just like, oh my God, and just started to cry. And then yeah. she started to say this stuff about camp. and. I just said that you work at camp because you're Gabrielle. It's not your sexual orientation as to why you work at camp. Yeah. So it changes nothing. Uh, who you are and your sexual orientation is your, your business. How you want to, to express it to our families or our staff is your business. It's not anybody else's. So, um, 
I feel very confident and very at ease with with her sexuality and it just was it, it was hard that she had to wait that long yeah you know what i think that's probably the hardest thing um her her male partner is still in our family he's like a son and it's it, it's so nice that she had somebody who was so supportive yeah and we're just as a family very happy that she's content and happy and it really has no bearing on her employment or what she does as a job and it's just it hasn't it hasn't caused any issues whatsoever gabrielle is gabrielle that's basically i think for me yeah fair yeah. enough yeah i don't remember the other part of the alcohol and <laughs> Well, well, there you go. <laughs> thank you both so much for sharing that. Um, and Gabs, I especially want to thank you for sharing that sort of like vulnerable side. Um, and both of you, like these are, are hard things that we go through, um, you know, to come out and we each have our own stories. Um, and I think it really highlights the need for why representation matters in the camping yeah. community uh, and in any community for that matter, because if you can see it, you can be it. Um, and that is true across so many different identities um, outside of sexual orientation. Um, one other question I wanted to ask about this, Gabs, is if you feel like this um, affected how people perceived you in the camping world outside of um, your, like, Camp Oro, outside of your camp. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think it's really, it, it's a, I think it's very interesting um, when, you know, as I walked, walked, did around, as I white straight woman with a tall very handsome very lovely man i i had a lot of um doors i just felt so much more welcome in spaces and then as a you know single <laughs> white lady that walked the streets i just felt invisible and then as a um, woman who walks around with holding her girlfriend's hand i feel um, it, sometimes in danger and sometimes not welcomed. And I thought being invisible would be the worst. And then I realized, oh no, <laughs> actually, when you feel like you're, you're unwanted, that's sometimes worse. Um, the experience I got from being invisible was great deep sadness. And then some relief and freedom came from it because I was like, I'm invisible. I can do what I want. Oh my goodness, nobody cares. Um, and I think in the camp industry, I feel like, like certain people uh, accept me and it's great and they love me. I know I'm a better camp director because I'm being my authentic self. I know my staff respect me and I know that um, I'm, I'm certainly less stressed or anxious. I used to be, have such high anxiety. I've worked through that, but definitely coming out has really helped with that. But I didn't realize how many doors were closed to the queer community in camp. Um, and that's the privilege of being a, a white straight person within our industry and within our organize, within any organization. And then I realized how many doors were closed uh, to to queer people and and a lot of minorities um, and that really uh, frustrated me and hurt me but then our our little puppy is crying in the background because she's sympathizing with the story um good job miss you can hang out but um, I realized that uh, I was really really sad but that sad turned into anger and purpose and um, and I want to have these conversations as much as possible and change the way we welcome people uh, intentionally. So yes, I've had doors absolutely closed in my face where I, where I would have never had closed before, where I was actually welcomed before, and now I am not. So it 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 was an awakening, but it was also an awakening to my privilege, the privilege that I have, that I, I've I've always had. Uh, so that allows me to see how much more work we need to do within our industry to be better. 
Thanks so much for sharing that. I think it's important that we can talk about the things that are fabulous about our industry while also looking really critically at it. Um, and Ruby taught me that, that you can hold two ideas in tension, even if they're conflicting. And I think that uh, we could talk about how wonderful camp is while also really talking about the amount of work that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate you diving into that. This uh, conversation has been fabulous so far. We're going to take a quick pause here and we'll be right back with lots more from Jackie and Gabs. ACA Illinois takes the time to keep a pulse on what is happening within the camp community. They care about us as camp pros and seek to serve and provide programming that meets our needs. Staying connected and in touch with the field helps drive our creativity and work when it comes to designing professional development programs. Rachel and I have both benefited greatly from ACA Illinois' educational programs and rec recommend them highly to everyone else. From webinars to summits, both in-person and virtual, ACA Illinois provides high quality, relevant programming for camp pros. As we find ourselves in the midst of what could be a long winter for many of us, and as the pandemic draws out, don't let Zoom fatigue keep you from staying connected. The ACA Illinois calendar is full of great events to keep you busy and connected all year long. Don't let your professional development fade. How fantastic is it that you can attend professional development without the cost of a flight or attend a summit like the Women in Camp Summit Cassie and I recently attended from the comfort of your couch in your favorite old camp sweatpants. Make the best of this pandemic and get connected. Be sure to bookmark the ACAIL.org forward slash calendar and stay in the loop of all of their great events. All right, well, we're going to dive right back in and talk a little bit more on finding yourself in the camp community and what that looked like for both Jackie and Gabs as a mother and daughter. Um, we know a lot of people find their own way, but Gabs, you also had kind of a family to help you find your way into camp. Did you find that you were riding the coattails of your mom and family or were you kind of forging your own path? I was uh, very much so riding the coattails of not just uh, Jackie, but also the previous owner of the organization. I was at tables that um, I got to be at tables with uh, keynotes of conferences, go into the rooms of backstages of where all the uh, presidents were of the Canadian Camp Association and the American Camp Association, especially our work with ICF has opened up so many doors and I would have never been part of ICF without Waro and without Jackie. So I, you know, there is a very good reason why I am on Camp Hacker uh, Camp Code and here chatting with you two uh, today. That is because of the experiences that Jackie has provided for me and that Waro, because of our value system of volunteering and being part of organizations, I've always had seats at the table, um, which I plan to, as much as possible, be open about talking about that there's two sides of the camp industry and, and that we can always do better. So there, there's a huge privilege in because I chose this um, industry, I have absolute doors that are that are open to me and I'm very privileged to, to be part of. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <Straight up. laughs> no, thank you for diving in and just just letting it all out. <laughs> it's good to have open, honest conversations like that mm -hmm. for you. Jackie, how did you support Gabs as she kind of ventured into this world of camping? I think it's important to understand that the opportunities that Gabrielle was given, my staff, all the staff were given. I didn't choose to uh, choose to have Gabrielle in front of everyone. I chose from my previous director, Madeline Allen Ferg was her camp name that she told me right from the beginning that part of my job was going to conferences. And part of going to conferences was volunteering. And part of being part of camp associations was being on committees. Yeah. And she expected that of me. And so then I expected that of my staff. It happens to be that Gabrielle is the co-director. So, you know, I think that that opens up what I want for her to do with our staff, you know, before the pandemic, we would go to conferences and sometimes I'd bring nine staff mm -hmm. and yeah. everybody would be like, why are you bringing all these staff? And I said, well, because how else am I going to 
um, put the information we're learning out to our staff or to other camps in the community. It can't always be me. It has to be mm -hmm. other people. I did make sure that they were sitting at tables. I did make sure that we separated ourselves up mm -hmm. so that one was sitting with Joanna Warren Smith and one was sitting with Beth and one was with Ruby or, yeah. um, you know, whoever, you know, it was, but the whole idea was that they needed to volunteer and they needed to put in their time. It just happens to be Gabra's in the position where she's co-director. So she's more often in the limelight. Mm -hmm. The first time that she ever did anything volunteer, she was 14 and it was at the international camping uh, Congress in Toronto. And her job was to take care of um, uh, Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, sorry. And so that was her job for the whole day to take care of Jane Goodall. And at one point, Jane Goodall needed to go to her hotel room to get something. And she got into the elevator and there was David Suzuki. So she was in the elevator with David Suzuki and Jane Goodall. And the two of them were looking at each other. And this little 14 year old is freaking out. But you know, on the inside, on the outside, I was very, very calm, very composed, very <laughs> professional. <laughs> I think, I think the camping industry got very used to the fact that my children were there. It wasn't just Gabrielle, it was her brothers and also many, many staff. We also live in the country. I wanted my children to experience some city things. So going to conferences and staying with my family in Toronto and getting on the subway was important for me. They mm -hmm. needed to learn those things. Yeah. They needed to get into a plane. They needed to go on a train. They didn't have those opportunities unless I took them with them with me. I worked even before I was a full-time uh, camp director. I always worked when they were off school. So I was a downhill ski instructor and I was a camp director. And so I made sure that I took them out of school to events like that so they could spend time with me when I wasn't actually at camp working. So yeah. if that answers that. It does. Um, I want to, you, you keep referring, Jackie, to making sure people are seen as people and as their own person. Mm -hmm. How did you make sure that Gabs was seen as her own person and not just as your daughter? I think that when I brought her to most things, I made sure I had other staff there. Yeah. So yeah. that they, so it wasn't just Gabs and I, because uh, I think that- I don't think we've ever gone to something where it's just us except for maybe one or two international things. Yeah. Yeah. But even then we had some other staff come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I think that's I think that's how I did it. Um, I also uh, feel like uh, people who are close to us know that we don't see each other often. Other people think we see each other all the time. The pandemic has been, the highlight yeah. of the pandemic is the amount of time that we spend together. Yeah. Because we normally don't see much of each other unless we're at a conference. I haven't lived back at home since I was 17. 17. I'm 42. Yeah. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, all it's our been kids, a minute. <laughs> all our kids moved out when they were 17. So, um, yeah. So I think it was, it's just like very much making sure that we didn't always go to things together, that if we were going to sit at a table that I would sit with some people, she would sit with other people. It was making sure that it, if I was on a committee that Gab was on a different committee, yep. but you know, you can't, we have the same last name. So, you know, they know that we're mother, daughter, or we're related in some way. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. I mean, you know, when you see the bell, the Larry Bell and his, his children and, and the gross nigger, gross and all those different people that, you know, their family, their family, they can't be, it can't be an, it's not a negative thing. It's just really showing support and understanding that you've chosen to do this and your child has chosen to do it. I have come across people that are still working in the camp industry and their parents are still working in the camp industry and they're in their nineties and these other people are my age and they're still not allowed to make choices in the business. What you need to understand is with Gabrielle is that I am the person who, if Gabrielle makes a choice about something and if I disagree with that, I make sure that I disagree in, pu in private, never in public. If I'm really, really excited about something, I will tell her that first and then present it to the, the staff. I make sure that because I am, I'm very, I'm much quieter than Gabrielle with the staff and everything. And, but if I'm questioning something, I will not stop it 
unless I really feel like it's going to, if it's going to hurt anyone or, or put anybody mm -hmm. awkwardly, I'll stop it. But otherwise I'll wait and then I'll discuss it with her in private. And that does happen, you know, because sometimes with my age and especially the things that are going on now, I sometimes don't have the correct language or I'm uncertain as to how we should be presenting it or if we should be presenting it. Mm -hmm. So I have to really, really step back and take a breath. And that I think is helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of learning and growing together. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. That's fabulous. Earlier on, you touched on um, learning from those who've come before us and other families. And I think it's really important that we spend a lot of time honoring those that come before us uh, because they've shaped where we are and where we are might not be perfect, but we've still, like we've all advanced. Um, and I think especially as Cassie and I identify more on like the younger end of like camp professionals that we are very clear that we honor those who come before us and that we um, place a lot of value mm -hmm. in learning from uh, previous generations. Um, and I would love both of you to speak on how you've learned from other camp families and the support that you've gotten from them in learning to work well together. Um, Gabs, maybe if you want to start from your perspective, um, did you have friends growing up who were also in like a similar position to you? How, do, where did your learnings come from? I, I didn't have, I had Mike Pierce actually approached me. Um, I think I was in my maybe late twenties and just said like, Hey, if you ever want to learn a little bit more about what this looks like full time, or if you ever just want to talk about this, I'd be happy to chat with you and, you know, talk about like big shoes, you know, Jack Pierce it, you, is, has very big shoes. And, and I would say for about 10 years of my professional career, I was called, um, you know, you know, two, two things. I was called like, or, you know, hi, uh, please tell Jackie, I say hi at a conference or hi, Jackie, how are you? These were my names um, from other camp professionals. And so I was, I had a, a shadow in front of me, but Mike, Mike approached me and, and let me know that, you know, that this could be tough and this isn't easy. And it was the first time that it occurred to me that it, it might, might not be. I think, you know, I have so many wonderful uh, people that I looked up to and, you know, I could go on you know, Jane McCutcheon, um, Jorgie, just so many people that, that I just from a distance, you know, admired and I just love their professionalism and, and um, how they just did what they did. Uh, Jeff Bradshaw, um, basically everybody that starts with a J, I guess. Um, so the, you know, Jill, Jill Dundas, I can keep going, Jen Dundas, Jackie Rail. Uh, but, but I think, I think what I learned from other families, and this is, this is the sad, the sad part of, of the camp industry and, and families working together is that sometimes camps are put, put first and not, and family isn't put first. And the one thing that I can say hands down with Jackie is that I've never felt like camp came first above us, um, us meaning myself and my brothers and my father. Um, she has, she has a big, she has a lot on her shoulders but if, if I was absolutely not happy here, she would make sure that I, I would find happiness somewhere else. Um, the business isn't dependent on me. And I think that's also a part of why Jackie brings other, the pressure, just think of the pressure of being the only person from this organization being brought to all these, to different conferences or on volunteer, that, that pressure was spread out amongst other staff members. And I was part of a, a, a family of, of young women that were learning together. I didn't have that pressure. I was told that I was, I could make a decision every year to see if this was the right place for me for the next year. Um, but I really did see from the outside, um, certain, a lot of camp camps are run by families. The mis one of the biggest mistakes I see is that they put camp first, not always, but sometimes. And that can't, I, I think that that allows, that squashes creativity, that creates anxiety. Um, yeah, but I was definitely called Jackie for about 10 years, solid. <laughs> or say hi to Jackie. At least they knew I wasn't her, so that was pretty good. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, and I really uh, enjoy that there was that, like, sort of yearly check-in, like, hey, like, is this what you still want? Because um, I think that's important, because also, like, as you're growing up, there's so many opportunities out there um, that you don't even know exist. Like, there's just 
you know, sometimes I talk to my staff who are 17 or 18 and they're like, I don't know what I want to do. And I'm like, you probably don't even know what it is you want to do because you don't even know that that exists yet. You just like haven't gone down a path to take you to some neat opportunity. Um, Jackie, you sort of, it really sounds like you laid the foundation for you two to work well together. Um, what was your relationship like with other camp families? Did you have mentors who helped you figure out the best way to balance like a family and camp in this relationship? Did you have other people that you turned to for help? Uh, yeah, I think that um, as I go to lots of conferences and I take lots of sessions, I did a lot of sessions on succession. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did it from, and I hadn't been in uh, the owner long when I was going to succession and people thought that was a little odd, I think. But in succession, you learn what's working and what's not working. Mm. Um, and from the get-go, my husband and I said that this is our business, but our family comes first. And if we decided as a couple that we didn't want to do this anymore, that was okay for us. Um, that it wasn't a lifelong decision. My mantra, mantra has always been that we came to Quebec for one year and it's going on year 46. And so it's been a really long year. <laughs> so it's not something that we sort of wrote in st stone and said, we're going to continue this all the time. It is, it is our life for sure. And yes, I did talk to many families, but in those, um, those sessions that I took, I heard stories of people who didn't want to be in the business, yeah. but mm -hmm. felt obliged to and maybe not even forced to but felt obliged to so a number of years ago Gabrielle told us that she wanted to um, go to Manchester England and do a degree in design and my her dad immediately said yes how much do you need and it wasn't it yeah. wasn't ever a problem but literally she got on the plane and we both went oh we're in trouble <laughs> She's not coming back to <laughs> That's it. I'm over. <laughs> we went to visit her in, in Manchester and we saw this super excited, invested woman in this new career. And we were so proud of her. And there was this fraction of us that was so sad. And when we picked her up at the airport, we were sure we were getting the um, done speech and she looked at us and she said thank you so much for sending me to Manchester thanks dad for paying for the course <laughs> I made a decision and then she took a breath it felt like a really long time and she said I'm staying and camping and we went what <laughs> um yeah so I think I think look I, what happens when you let your children go and explore yeah. The exactly. crazy thing is, is that when I was, when I thought I had to choose between the two and when I was doing my design course, I was like, nobody's going to see this connection, but I feel it so strong in me that design and camp together are a match made in heaven. And I think there's so many combinations of camp plus, you know, camp engineering mm -hmm. camp, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's so many connections. But it, it rejuvenated and it got me to look at camp in a completely different way than I ever thought. But I, well, you had told me later, many years later, that, that they were like already planning on selling the camp. They're like, yeah. if she's not in, we're out, we're done. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Um, so happy you didn't tell me until like so many years later. But but I think that that is such an important part. You you even though as a family and it's your career and you know, you obviously like, you love me more than Chad and Morgan. And there's, there's, there's that piece there, but even though you felt it, you really didn't let me know that you didn't want me to explore and adventure out. And it's, it's, it's a child's life. All of us, we have our own lives. We need to be able to do what we need to do, you know, to, but I, I came back like, so excited and, and ready to take on camp as a professional and like, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very interesting. To say <laughs> you two had like different careers already planned. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh she wants to stay. Damn. <laughs> We're stuck here too now. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and I love that instead of saying like you need to fit into this box to be a camp professional, you were like, let's just open this box and build a new bigger one. Um, like, come on yeah. in. And I think that that's really important. And when we talk about the different ways that our identities line up with camp, we're we're opening that box and we're creating new boxes um, because camp professionals, you know, over the decades have evolved and continue to look different, and they're only going to continue to. Um, so I think that's really important that you that and, you brought that up. The one thing I'd like to say is that I think that in any industry, I feel that in any industry or anything that you put a lot of work into, you, you attract the people to your circle that have your same values and, and mm -hmm. share your, your beliefs and your ethics and things. So going back to when Gabrielle came out, I did not have in the camping industry one flicker of anything negative. Yeah. Because the people that I'm surrounded by in the camping industry on the whole are very open, outgoing, yes. my age that are willing to try to do things that are different and, and you know, looking to the future like Joss Palm and mm -hmm. and Jane McCutcheon and Joss Palm another Jay yeah, yeah. got it <laughs> but you know what I mean like I think that yes there's work to be done in the camping industry but as an industry my personal experience is that that industry tends to be a, a lot more understanding and open than some other industries. I know there's still work to be done. I'm not downplaying that in any way, but for me, it's been, it's been a very positive experience. Yeah, and you taught me that, you know, you taught me that in the sense of, of, of encouraging me to, to be myself in front of people that I looked up to that I was afraid would have a, a negative reaction. Um, I think your perspective was helpful for me, but yes. Mm -hmm. Still work to be done, however. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, this has been a, a great 45 minutes of conversation. And we are so grateful to both of you, Jackie and Gabs, for holding these conversations with us and opening up your personal lives and sharing your stories with us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. And we wanna thank you for joining us beyond camp. We wanna thank all of our listeners for joining us today as well. We hope that you are able to connect and reflect with us as we journey beyond the property lines and bring camp with us. As we wrap up, we want you to be able to reach out and connect with us. Uh, Jackie and Gabs, how can our listeners connect with you? Well, you can follow me and DM me on Instagram at Gabrielle Rail, Rail with uh, two L's. And you can check out where we work at waro.com, O U A R E A U.com. And if you want to send me an email, you can send the email to info at waro. And uh, my good friend Alexandre will let me know that you sent me a message. And you can also send that Jackie as well, info at waro is the best place. Yes. Do you, um, want, me to, do you want me to get your um, Snapchat? handle and no no <laughs> <laughs> and i will answer my email. <laughs> you will that's why i'm not giving out my email i'm giving out alexan's email <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much rachel how can our listeners connect with you uh folks are always welcome to send me an email at kentar at girlguides.ca thank you and you can reach myself cassie at cassie.bloy at stefanricard.ca Please remember to check out our show notes at gocamp.pro slash beyondcamp. And another great big thank you to Jackie and Gabs for spending time with us again today and to the team at Go Camp Pro for continuing to hold space for these conversations and to the crew at ACA Illinois for their sponsorship and support of this idea. To our producers, Matt and Jotham for making us sound phenomenal every single week. And to you, our listeners, for making the time to listen. Your dedication allows us to keep moving forward. Beyond Camp is part of the Go Camp Pro Podcast Network. Check out all our other podcasts at gocamp.pro slash podcasts. Go well and safely, friends. We'll see you next week. <laughs>